Okay, good evening. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the special meeting of the Guilford Town Board. First thing we're going to do is have a pledge to the flag. The flag is in the front. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The purpose of the special meeting tonight is um, to have a presentation on renewable energy. Um, at this point in time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Phil Hoffmeyer, who teaches at SUNY Morrisville. And I'll, I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Hoffmeyer. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I apologize. I'm at the tail end of the cold right now. So hopefully my throat will last through whatever we need to do tonight. It's also why I'm holding this to try to uh, keep me lubricated for a little bit here. So I apologize if my voice starts conking out part way through. Uh, the next general thing that I will mention, I see some of you have notepads out. I am more than happy to give you this presentation. So if there are things that you'd like to pursue further, uh, everyone will have full access to all of this. So uh, this is almost like a step two or, or round two of this presentation. I gave something very similar in Norwich not too long ago, a couple of months ago. And uh, I was asked to come back to talk specifically to the town of Guilford because I'm, I'm well aware of the wind farm that is coming in here, as well as some plans for solar in the area. Having said that, um, I am here as a representative, re representative of SUNY Morrisville and my position there, which is a renewable energy professor, I have no affiliation with anybody here or any industry that's here. Uh, my goal is to have a conversation about wind and perhaps other renewable energy systems. And I've been doing this for about 12 years, coming to town boards, talking about energy systems where you have questions. And I'm hoping you have some thoughts, some concerns, some questions, so that this can be a useful conversation. Uh, so that's kind of what I want to deal with a little bit, is the way that energy and community come together. And uh, this is one of the most challenging things that's facing the energy industry today. And it's not unique in any way, shape, or form. OK, so what I would like to do is just give a real brief introduction of who I am and what I hope to talk about while I'm here today, uh, why we need energy systems. And this is a part that's easy to gloss over, but it's incredibly important to frame the rest of the conversation. Because this issue is not going to go away anytime soon, so we have to understand why we're doing it then talk about what I perceive to be many of your questions, um, and I'll preempt many of them. But if there are additionals, I'm happy to address those as well. And then I want to be really careful with things. Um, it's really easy to, cut, to get caught in the world of rhetoric. People are delighted to share lots of their wisdom with us. And I want to be really, really careful about what wisdom we gain and how we interpret what's actually being said. Uh, and I find a lot is lost in the details. And so what I want to do is not glance over them, but actually think about the details and a little bit more uh, information. And I want to be really careful here. It's a little bit formal because I'm up here and I have a presentation, and um, it's lecture-ish in nature. But that's just because of the format. Uh, I don't want it to become that. What I want it to become is as interactive as possible. So if I'm saying something that doesn't make sense, please let me know. If I'm saying something that you want to pursue a little further, please let me know that as well. And I will continually uh, try to play ping pong with you going back. <coughs> but as much as I can, I would like to make this a conversation so that your um, concerns are addressed. <coughs> so a little bit about who I am. Uh, I've been teaching at SUNY Morrisville since 2008. Uh, I am a very technical kind of person. So I teach installation, design, uh, system configurations, I'm, I'm very much on the technical aspect of things. Uh, I'm much more comfortable climbing a tower than I am uh, kind of dealing with community planning in general. It's a little bit outside of my wheelhouse relative to the actual designs and builds. Having said that, it's impossible to become uh, proficient in the technical side without interacting with community. So uh, if there are things that we need to address a little bit further, um, realize a couple of things. First, I am very technical in nature, so I can address 
how do turbines function, what are the genuine concerns that we have with the technologies, we can play the efficiency game. Anything technical is perfectly fair game. There are people far more knowledgeable than I am when it comes to what is the actual policy that's dictating some things. Again, I have a fair amount of information in that realm, but I will be more than happy to say that's a little bit beyond my reach here, but here's what I think is going on. So, uh, <clears throat> wind is one of the areas that I teach in. I have three courses dealing with wind energy systems and everything from wind as a resource to installation and design and permitting. So, uh, a fair amount that we should be able to draw on. Now, let's start framing this conversation a little bit more to know why we are here to begin with. And it's pretty simple. If I were to look at where we are in terms of where we get our energy from, this is all the energy that we use in the United States. And just playing, just uh, doing a little bit of math game here. <coughs> What's really important to realize is this is 2018 data, but it's the most recent that we have. It's from April of 2019. And if I were to start looking at this pie graph, on the left-hand side, top and bottom, if I were to add up petroleum, natural gas, and coal, or in other ways, take renewable energy and nuclear, <coughs> this off, over 80% of our energy comes from fossil fuels right now. And this is for electricity and transportation and all the other things you use energy for. And, and uh, the one thing that's really important for this is that's inescapable right now, is over 80% of our energy comes from a finite resource. Okay, this takes 50 to 300 million years to reproduce. No matter what we do, that's locked in the ground. Once we convert it to something else, it's gone. And so, because that is a finite resource, we don't have an option. We have to pursue something else. Uh, so what else do we pursue? Nuclear power, sure, about 8% of our energy comes from that. If I were in France, almost 50% of the energy would come from nuclear energy. Uh, and then renewable sources. So this conversation is not about nuclear, although I'd be delighted to have that conversation as well, uh, since that's one that many people are interested in, clean energy resource. We'll get a little bit of nuclear as we go forward here, but not much. If I look at the renewable energy and then break that apart, uh, if I look to see where most of our energy comes from that is renewable, meaning it can replenish itself within our lifetime, uh, hydropower makes up a quarter of that, biofuels make up almost half of that, a little bit of wind, 22%, 8% solar, 2% geothermal. So again, if I'm playing a little bit of a math game here, 22% of 11% is 2.4%. So if I'm talking just about industrial wind, uh, just about 2.5% of our total energy comes from wind resources right now. It's got to go up. Uh, and, and that's one of the things that I want to leave you with. I know I'm just beginning, but I have to leave you with this. There's no option here. Uh, we have finite resources powering our nation. Those finite resources are depleting rapidly. We have no choice. Renewable energy is something that has to happen here. So now the question, once I can get past that part, the question is, uh, not good enough. Let's keep going. Why? Let's play a little quiz here. So fossil fuels, they're principally carbon. 90 to 95 percent of any given fossil fuel. Uh, if I were to hold up, I forgot my piece of coal. I usually hold up a piece of coal right now. But if I were to look at coal, about 95 percent of that piece of coal that I would be holding is carbon. And the part that's really interesting, right? Carbon's pretty heavy. If I were to hold a block of carbon, drop it, it's going to hit the ground. So I can ask a question here. If I combust carbon, which is an energy resource, and what I know is when I combust that, Combustion just means I'm adding oxygen to it. So if I were to take a pound of carbon, burn that to do something, gen, you know, uh, run a steam engine or whatever it happens to be, <laughs> how much carbon dioxide do I get out of it? It goes up into the atmosphere, right? This is the part that people are interested in. So I can take a pound of carbon, add a little oxygen to it, then what happens to carbon dioxide that goes up into the atmosphere? About how much carbon dioxide do I get out of this? It's okay if you don't answer. Pound. A pound, right? One for one kind of thing? 3.7 pounds. Okay. Now the question is how, right? And I'm not here to play chemistry game, but okay, let's talk about chemistry just for one brief moment here. Because again, it's easy to forget why we're here to begin with. And if I look at the periodic table, in fact, the periodic table uh, just had a 
a happy anniversary not too long ago. And I look up in the, the top right corner here, I have carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. If I focus in a little bit more of those, uh, on the bottom I have atomic mass. So if I were to look at carbon, it's got atomic mass of about 12. If I were to look at oxygen, it's got carbon or uh, atomic mass of about 16. So when I combust something and I add oxygen to it, I go from 12, which was just carbon, to 12 plus two oxygens, which is another 16, which is another 16, and then that equals 44. So I have gone from 12 to 44, and if I put that in a simple ratio, it's about 3.7. Again, why are we here? Because right now, most of our electricity, or much of our electricity, is produced by fossil fuels, principally coal and natural gas. Both of those are principally carbon, which means every time that I use kilowatt hours to run lights, or whatever else I'm using it for, I have to keep this conversion in my mind. I have to, at least. Um, because it's important, and part of the reason that you should be asking yourself is, so what? We have CO2 in the atmosphere, who cares? Um, well, I used to do climate science. So my PhD research was specifically addressing this question of, so what? And I could pick any one of hundreds of thousands of documents that are out there that all say about the same thing. <laughs> And it basically says that there is one-way causality here. That's it. It means that when you increase CO2, you increase warming. There's no way around it. And people like to think that there is some disagreement about this in the scientific community. And I'll address how there is that disagreement. But nobody disagrees about this. Nobody does. And so who cares about that? Well, I live in an ag place, right? I can look at any one of my neighbors, or even out my backyard, and realize I live in a farming community. My land, I actively have <laughs> as a, a, an agricultural zone. So why do I now care? Well, if I look at this, in any particular rural landscape, there are things that I need to worry about. Increases in pathogens, increases in invasive species that have never been here before. I just went uh, walk on a walk with my dog and my two daughters yesterday. There were 17 ticks between the three of us, and there didn't used to be ticks here, so why is this? Right, we have to start asking ourselves these simple questions. You need chickens. I do have chickens. I have 47 chickens right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> still can't stop ticks from coming into my woodlot. Um, but the, the, the reason why we have these things are what are known as landscape amplifiers, okay? One thing leads to the next, leads to the next, which is a snowballing concern that we cannot stop. And this is what's known as a positive feedback loop. Now, the, the Earth operates on negative feedback loops. In fact, so does your body. And I'll give you an example of this. So let's say it's 20 degrees outside. The wind is blowing. And I'm dressed in exactly what I'm wearing right now. If I walk outside the door and then continue walking, and it's 20 degrees and the wind is blowing, what does my body tell myself? I'm cold. Okay, my body doesn't like to be cold. So it, it produces a negative response that I need to correct. And the way that I correct that is by putting on a jacket, maybe growing my hair out if I could, whatever I could do to stay warm. Um, a negative feedback loop tells you when there is something going astray, and then how we correct it. The problem with climate change is that they are positive feedback loops, otherwise known as self-reinforcing. So I could go for hours and hours on this. In fact, Scott was one of my students. Uh, and part of a, a lot of what we talked about are these positive feedback loops. And I'll give you an example of a positive feedback loop for humans. Drug addiction. Okay, Drug addiction is, well, my body's not feeling great, so what am I going to do? I'm going to take something that helps my body feel better. Except, this becomes a snowballing effect, where your body starts thinking to correct itself by saying, I'm not feeling good anymore, so what do I need to do? I need to continue taking drugs. And then more, and then more, and then more. And so it starts feeding on itself. This is what happens with climate change. Okay, if we start adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, it gets warmer. As it gets warmer, it can hold more carbon dioxide, which means now as we start adding more through, 
we get a snowball runaway effect that has all sorts of really nasty side effects of it. Now there is some, some scientific discourse here where we say we don't necessarily agree how bad this is. But this is where there's a lot of misconception. So this is, this is a really, really famous graph, by the way, that comes out of the International Panel for Climate Change, the IPCC reports. It was called the hockey stick graph. So uh, one of these in particular, uh, I could, it's the man in, at all oh, this, there's like a bluish colored line that's in there. Okay, so, so this is one that the IPCC actually put in their, their climate change reports. And they said, <clears throat> look, we're, we're having this runaway temperature anomaly that has to do with carbon dioxide and time. And then all these scientists went crazy about this. They went nuts. And the reason is because there was a, 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 an incorrect mathematical um, couple of formulas that were used in here. And so all this data was given out to lots of different people, and then they all applied a slightly different statistical method out of it, and so they all kind of corrected and converged, and everybody was kind of happy again. Now, the problem with this is that the scientists all agree on the trend. They disagree about this really small, this error part that kind of shimmies and shakes between the different analysis methods. But this got interpreted as scientists disagree about climate change, so it's not a concern. Well, that's a very different kind of interpretation than what the scientists were actually talking about that was the difference here, and it just had to do with statistical analysis stuff. Was your hand up a second ago? Yeah. Yeah. Why is there the dip in the middle, middle of the century between 19 and 2000? Right in through here? Yeah, there's a, a noticeable dip. It yeah. went up and then dropped. Yeah, of course. This is, so, so you get these kind of anomalies that happen all the time, right? And in fact, we could focus on that one because it's closest to us, but you get all these other kind of changes that happen through here. This just has to do with relationships of where the sun is relative to the Earth. They're called Milinkovitch cycles, and they have to do with how far away the sun is from the Earth, and then periodic uh, bursts of energy from the sun. And this just happened to be a period of contraction, where everything was coming in a little bit. So what's important to realize here is climate change doesn't occur over these little tiny periods. Right? I can cherry pick any level of data here that I would like to. Um, I'd be more than happy to cherry pick any period of time here and say, no, 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 the Earth was cooling. In fact, if, if someone gives you a climate change information over like the past five years of any five-year period of time, throw it out. It's meaningless. Climate doesn't operate that way. That's weather. So you have to be really careful about how you look at information. Climate is a very long-term impact. So this kind of increased acceleration is something that has never been seen in any historical data that we've been able to collect. Never has it happened before. Okay, I'm also not here to give a full climate change discussion. I just want to phrase this for you because again, what we're talking about here is inescapable. If it doesn't happen today, this conversation will happen in five years and then it'll happen in seven years. So let's just kind of frame this and say, we have to do something about that. So, uh, I'm from Niagara Falls. Uh, I have three siblings of mine who live in Grand Island. And in Grand Island, they're going nuts right now <clears throat> because a solar installation that was designed by some of my graduates is now being installed. And I don't have to travel very far from here or anywhere else that is looking at wind that knows that communities are being torn apart by this question of, should we move forward with this? <laughs> And this kind of public discourse is very different than scientific discourse. Scientific discourse, we can go back to facts. And we can say, what is the factual evidence that we have to follow here? Communities and the decisions that are made, hopefully they're informed by facts. But the question is different. It's what should we do about them? And that's the part that I want to talk about today is how do we address this so that as a community, the community doesn't get torn apart by known facts that we're going to have to deal with this. And hopefully, what we can do is at least settle on the kind of discussion to have. Like, I, I have no intention of convincing somebody here one way or the other. That's not my job. My job is to give you as much information as I can so that you can be informed and hopefully ask the right questions. 
Now, I also want to frame the kind of questions that we ask, because some tend to be more helpful than others. <clears throat> Let me give you an example of one that I don't feel is terribly fruitful, although common. Many of us would argue, I think, if we lived in the heart of coal country, and if we took a step back and we said, is this a good idea? Many of us would probably say, it's probably not the best idea. And all that you have to do is, when I say live in coal country, as in, I know many people who do, uh, when one of those retention slurry dams breaks, and the amount of catastrophe that happens downstream of a slurry store for a coal deposit, when that erupts, I don't think there's a single person here who says, this is a great idea. Let's continue this. Now, there might be some reason that we want. Maybe our entire family history is tied to coal production. That's a different question. The question is, should we continue this for the sake of energy production? And in fact, if you look at coal nationwide, even the people who are in coal industries are saying, this is not the best thing we can do. So then why don't we just shift right away to renewables? Well, the last, this is pretty simple to say. I just don't want it in my community. Everyone, I hope, is familiar with NIMBYism, or NIMBY, not in my backyard, right? But to me, I'm not sure it's quite that simple. It's easy to portray it that way. I just don't know that it's quite that simple of a question that I just don't want it in my backyard, and that's it. But what I will say is this. Many people who don't want to admit this to themselves, that the only reason they are against wind or solar is because it's in their backyard, the problem is when they try to take on some pseudo-scientific reasoning to, to make it feel like it, that's not what they're trying to say, that's where real big problems occur. So again, part of it is, if you just don't want it in your backyard, fine, say so. But what I'm really interested in is when people don't want it in their backyard and then try to pawn off some scientific reason because of that. And you have to be really careful and you don't want to do that, uh, in my opinion because it's, it's not a helpful way to actually frame community discussions. So what I'd like you to do is to think for just a moment. <clears throat> I have some questions and concerns that I have when I have wind, any thought of it going up and around me. So, <clears throat> like you, in my town, I am less than 2,700 feet from a turbine that's being proposed for my area right now. And in fact, in my email yesterday, I got an email propaganda thing from an anti-wind company for uh, my town. They went through, found my property map, sent me an email that says, you probably have these concerns about wind. The response that they got was not probably what they expected, but I'm in the exact same boat many of you are. And so I do have these concerns. And what I want to know is if there's something in addition to these that is of huge concern to anyone here. I'm going to address these ones in particular because this, this tends to be one for most. But if there's an additional concern, even if you don't want to bring it up right at the moment, let me know as we go through this. I'll leave this up here for just one minute. Again, my goal, <clears throat> not as lecturish as I can, more conversation along the way would be delightful, and hopefully we can spark some interest along here. So I'm just going to go through this list repeatedly. Uh, first, visual aesthetics. Many people just don't like the sudden wind turbines. In fact, on my drive down here, I saw signs, right? So I came from Morrisville, and as I'm driving down River Road, East River Road, I see signs that mostly say, save Guilford. My question is, from what? No, I didn't put that sign up. I didn't make the sign. I'm just curious what we have to save it from. And I think that that part is helpful to think a little bit about. Um, is it that we're trying to save it from a view? And if that's what we're trying to save it from, um, my quick response to that is something like this. And again, I know some of you are in this discussion in Norwich, but to me this is 
This is about the only way I can think about this, really. My family goes every year to a, a house in Vermont. My wife started going there when she was two or three. And we rent the same house every year. Uh, this is Echo Lake. And as we look out, this is the view that's in my mind. It's in her mind. It's in my kid's mind. It's in her grandparents' mind. It's this view that's right here. And this is the way many of us think about our communities. Now, if I just relax this view a little bit, take a half step back, open my lens a little bit, <clears throat> this is what the actual view is. <laughs> this isn't in my mind, right? I see the previous one. But I know that this is what the actual view is. But think of what else we've gotten used to. In fact, these blend in so much to the landscape. Right? If I'm in Louisiana fishing and I see an oil rig, I'm going to go right up next to it because I know a fish-like structure and I'm going to go try to catch some fish right up next to it. And I'm perfectly content that it's out there. I, I, I counted 27 communications towers on my drive down from campus to here. We're perfectly content with them because we get better cell phone reception. Right? So in fact, the more that we start arguing about communications towers, it's always going in the direction of we want more, we want better coverage, we want them to be faster, taller, better, so that we can stay connected to one another. Uh, again, I grew up in Niagara Falls. This was the birthplace of our AC grid system in the United States. And the transmission corridor that's there is all that I think about when I think about my home. I don't think about the waterfall that's there. I think about the Robert Moses power plant and the way that we're shipping electricity all over the place because of that. But we are so used to this, we are so accustomed to it, we don't see it anymore. And so, on my daily commute home, or to work, every single day, if I look to the west, to the west what I see is the Fenner Wind Farm, if I look to the east I see the Munsville Wind Farm, and we're right in the midst of planning another one. And this is my community, this is my view. And it's the only view my kids have ever known. These wind farms were put in in 2001, and so my kids who were born in 2010 and 2013, they have never known a world that doesn't have turbines within two miles of their home. It's not even a thought. And in fact, I would argue that we're not even a single generation away. The next generation that's born, every single person here will associate rural landscapes with turbines. There is no way around it. So what I want to do is put the visual aesthetics thing to bed. Because it's going to happen. How do you do that? I mean, you can't erase them. Right now, I agree. when I drive on my commute, and I hit the crest of a mountain, and I go over several on my way to work, uh, I look out, and I look out over valleys, and other than some homes that uh, punctuate that's it. All you see are trees. Yeah. And, and geography. Um, I agree. Shotgun blasting turbines, and it gives it a whole different personality. It goes from a rural, natural landscape, as much as it can be at this juncture, to a semi industrial. I would argue if it's agricultural right now, it's already semi-industrial. Um, and I'll have other arguments to, to make that as well. But again, I, I could take your argument and put it in 25 year segments. And that argument in 25 year segments, segments is identical to the same thing that's happening here. So my point is, it's going to happen. And there are a whole bunch of reasons why this is true. It's going to happen. The question is, when? Is it just that we're delaying it five years, delaying it 10 years, or do we embrace it in some way, shape, or form? Now, again, my job here is not to convince you. I can't convince anybody on visual aesthetics. I can't convince anybody here that something looks good. All I can say is that it is a fact that my children will never see a world where the rural landscape doesn't include turbines. It's just the way that it is. Now, again, our job here is to think a little bit about where and how, and whether or not as a community we embrace it. That's it.
That's it. I'm not trying to convince anybody that this looks good. Does that make sense? I, I will make no argument, in fact, that it does. Just one more thing. Just because you become accustomed to something doesn't make it right. I, I, I agree completely, which is why I say uh, my goal is not to say that this looks good. I simply say that it is. And it is in the landscape. And our children see it in the landscape. That's all that I'm trying to say. Not, I'm, again, I, I don't disagree with anybody who says that they drive here and say that this view shed is ruined by turbines. I, I will make no claim one way or the other. I have a personal preference that's different than anyone else's personal preference when it comes to aesthetics. <laughs> so that's what I mean by putting it to bed. Uh, so the next question people would ask then, if it is going to be part of the landscape, why do they have to be so big? This is a, a company I used to work with, Irving Green Energy, and why don't all the turbines just look like this? Low, we can put them below the trees. Why do they have to be three-bladed things that spin around? I teach two courses specifically on this question. And without beating the point up, it's quite simple. Uh, you get stronger wind the higher up you go. In addition to not only stronger wind, it's cleaner wind. And if you don't believe that, ride in an airplane, ride at tree level. Clean wind affects turbines the same way it does anything else that has aerodynamics on uh, Higher power density, this just means for the amount of space that you occupy, you get far more power that comes out of it. Higher efficiencies. We can play the efficiency game all day long. Uh, if we want to really focus on efficiencies, we can. That's neither here nor there. Most of that is on the industrial wind company to figure out. But if we have questions on efficiency, I can deal with that. It is absolutely fact. The higher up you go, the higher the efficiency is. Uh, which, if I put all that together, is cost effectiveness. Cost effectiveness for the, the wind company, the town, all sorts of things, it's far better the higher up you go. And you get a lower noise signature out of it as well. So people are concerned about noise. If I were to put this little thing anywhere near you, uh, you, would be, you would go insane for the amount of noise that comes out of it. So the higher up you go, the lower the noise signature tends to be. So these things are all scientific fact. Okay. So this is far easier for me to have conversation about because none of these are actually debatable. We can, we can argue about what to do about any one of those, but all of these are fact of the way turbines operate. So, unless we want to get into the specific engineering of them, higher machines are far better for everyone involved, with the exception of aesthetics. It's that simple. So, again, my job is not to try to convince anyone of the aesthetic nature of them, but the reason they're so big has, has scientific and engineering uh, lots of it behind it. So that should spark additional questions that we have along the way. So aesthetics as well. Uh, turbines are dangerous. This is something I hear all the time. And uh, it's not untrue, at least in my opinion. And in fact, again, I live right next to the Fenner Wind Farm. We've had a turbine fall over, that was in 2009, and then we had another machine that caught on fire and threw one of its blades. <coughs> and I teach technicians. So my technicians, I have graduates of my program who are working in confined spaces three to 500 feet up in the air with extraordinarily high voltage and current coming off of them. Uh, I take this slide extraordinarily seriously. Yes, there are dangers inherent in these systems. Yes, it is possible that our engineering could fail on a turbine just as it does with everything else. <coughs> I grant all of those things. And the question is, what are the results of these? Right? If two technicians get caught in a machine, does that mean that we no longer produce those machines? If I have a turbine that falls in a crop field, does that mean I no longer support machines that do this. Um, let's put dangers in a little bit of perspective here, in just a little bit. 
dangers in perspective go something like this. If I look at uh, the total signature of human deaths as a function of energy, don't worry about what a petawatt hour it is, it doesn't matter, it's just some unit of energy. And if I hold that unit of energy constant, and I just look at one aspect of danger, which is, as I consider it, the, the highest danger is that that results in human death. Um, here's what data show us. If I look at coal, oil, biofuels, <coughs> coal in particular is, is quite nasty. Oil, biofuels, as much as I love cutting my own firewood, burning it in my wood stove, that is a biofuel, it's a bioenergy system. Um, I do have to realize that I have a pretty significant impact on what I release into the atmosphere for this. On the lower scale, hydro, solar, wind, again, nuclear comes up, I'm happy to talk about nuclear as well. And if I look deeper into the causes of these things, if I look at the top three, coal, oil, uh, and biofuels, it has to do with how we get the fuel, fuel procurement. So what mining kinds of activities do I need? Uh, how do I transport them? What are the particulates upon combustion that we now have to deal with that we're breathing into our lungs? How do I deal with waste for a long term? That's really what these ones are impacting. Natural gas has a far lower signature here. Okay, natural gas isn't going anywhere anytime soon. It's a classic bridge fuel. It's relatively clean, uh, it's relatively safe, it's easily transported, and we're going to be using natural gas for quite a period of time. It is the transitional fuel. Again, it's, it's absolutely clear that that's going to be the case. Hydro, solar, wind, they all have about the same issues. Okay, it's relatively straightforward to uh, procure these, the materials that are required, and the, the installations, again, are relatively safe, as is their long-term operation. Nuclear is extraordinarily safe. We hear of catastrophic failures, and those catastrophic failures have enormous rippling impacts on them. But because they produce so much energy, on a scale like this, nuclear is incredibly safe. There are huge issues with what to do long-term with waste. But otherwise, nuclear is a fuel that people have to consider far more as we start moving into the future. Have to, there's no way around it. There are lots of challenges though with nuclear in, it, in and of itself. Though. So again, this is one way to consider dangers, just one. But it's one way that puts wind in a really strong position if the claim is that it's a dangerous system. It, it just doesn't pan out. There are dangers inherent, but as a system, not so much. Yes, sir? What happens to geothermal in that chart? Oh, geothermal wouldn't even show up here. Uh, in, in, terms of, in terms of total amount of energy that's produced, uh, the amount of geothermal electricity that we have in the United States is it, it just an, an incredibly small pittance. Now, if I were in Iceland, geothermal would be certainly higher than that, and I have no idea what it is, although I'm positive it's low on the scale. We just don't have geothermal resources like they do in Iceland uh, throughout much of the United States. And where we have it, nobody tends to live there, so it's kind of a challenge to transport. What are the harmful impacts of geothermal? Um, um, at large scale, sure, it's going to be a, a little bit like natural gas in terms of the procurement, it's drilling, it's piping, it's those kinds of things, although you don't have to transport it, so it should be distinctly lower than natural gas, distinctly lower than hydro. I mean, it's going to fall somewhere in that lower category, that's for sure. But in terms of an actual number, I don't have, I don't have a number for geo. But it'll be quite low on the scale. What's yes, the time frame for that chart? Uh, so, there, there, you mean, when was this chart actually produced? Like, there's a lot of coal mines and people employed in coal. Then there is a wind at this time that you know so Correct. that can be actually true. So so what this is this keeps energy constant. Okay, so it's saying how much electricity is produced, and based on that electricity production, it scales that accordingly. So it's somewhat time independent, if you will, because it's based on what the output of the system is. So another way of saying that is there's a whole lot more coal that's out there than there is wind. Okay. There's a whole lot more oil, though, than there is coal. 
right? So, so the, the part that's really important to understand here is this is independent of how big an industry is because it scales just based on how much energy that produces. But time-wise, like coal's been around way longer than wind, so are you counting for all the coal deaths? Or like, because are those all the wind deaths? I think like that would be my question on time. Yes. So, so this is saying, so this is also saying, let, let's, uh, on, the, on this entire article that it's saying, is what are the historic uh, deaths that we know of based on the amount of energy that's produced. Now let's put time in, in perspective. Coal has been around for a lot longer. Petroleum has been around for a long time. Biofuels have been around far longer than coal or oil have. Uh, and so when we start scaling these things, it's also saying the last 40 years has been all of our energy production. When we put this on a scalar basis, okay, maybe the last 60 years. Relatively little energy has been produced in our early years of using coal, petroleum, natural gas. Those things are, are logarithmic in the, their uh, growth, in their growth production. So yes, it's been a longer timeline, but in the initial part of that timeline, not much was going on. In there. So this is also saying, what's it, what does it look like as we move forward? The same rates are going to be occurring. So it's, think of it more as a rate than it is uh, an actual accounting of all of deaths that are occurring. It's more of a rate. So it, it is somewhat time independent. Does that make sense? Or? So, uh, let's put, uh, let's see, how else can I put this then? Yes, it's accounting for all deaths. So is, is the question then, wind should have more deaths for, per energy production than what this graph is showing. I guess I'm unsure, I'm unsure how these numbers would change in any way, shape, or form. Let's forget the numbers, the shape of this curve. From this, if I add up all of the, the human fatalities that have occurred through time, we would expect more, is this your question? We would expect more from coal than we would from wind because it's been around longer. Is that a fair? Okay, so if, if I were to look at this, <clears throat> hydro has been around longer than coal has. Right? Hydro has been around much longer than coal has. So would I expect there to be more deaths in hydro than coal just because it's been around longer? The answer is clearly no. Right? Because it's a far safer technology. Uh, that's what this is showing. Okay, so it is time independent. Yes, ma'am. So, wind turbines use permanent magnetic generators, correct? Some do. Most don't at the industrial scale. Well, last week at the open house at Calpine, I spoke to Chris Stanton. Mm -hmm. I asked him that question, and he replied to me that they do use them. So, going, Some do, go, right. going, well, That's what I going said. forward from there, Sure. so... These magnets contain rare earth elements, <coughs> correct? Sure. You didn't so know. they are mined. There's one mine here in the U.S., but most of them are mined in China. Agreed. Um, and most of the mines that are not in China send the rare earth elements that they do mine to China for processing. Um, so what about all the people in China that have died because of that? Um, <coughs> They show up in this. Well. Because this, if you look here, it's material for German, which is what you're talking about. They show up in these figures. So, turn my face here. So a two megawatt turbine, according to, I, I read several studies, I went with the lowest number here. This is a survey done by MIT, or research done by MIT says that on a two megawatt turbine, which the ones proposed for Guilford are three megawatt, uh, there are 752 pounds of rare earth elements per two megawatt turbine. So that means for the 25 that would be proposed here, that's 18,800 pounds of rare earth elements. <coughs> 
Mining one ton of rare earth element creates one ton of radioactive waste. So, judging on the turbines that are two megawatts, or again the ones proposed here would be three, that's creating over nine tons of radioactive waste. If you go to China, where most of this mining is done, there is a lake near the mines that has 10 times the radiation level of, as other areas. There are high rates, very high rates of cancer, osteoporosis, skin and respiratory problems. They can no longer farm in the region because animals are, die and nothing will grow. That's all these, all that's in that 90 deaths there? Agreed. So, I find that really hard to believe that that's oh, taking care of 150, only 150 people have died. Per energy production, right? So, so the important thing here is you have to understand that this is a rate. This is not a total number of people who have ever died with wind. This is saying per petawatt hour of electricity production. So it's, it's a unit of energy. Okay, so. Oh, I just, I let's, got, I let's, just got to say, I think that, you know, if, if we're producing over nine tons of radioactive waste just to produce or build the turbines proposed for Guilford, that sounds pretty crazy. Nine tons of radioactive waste. Yes. I would just like to add, if we're going to have the rare earth materials discussion, and we're not, I mean, I don't want to get into it, but it's, it's in a lot of other stuff too. Your cell phones, your computers, you know, I have a degree in environmental policy from Syracuse. I'm not just off the hip here. If you want to spout numbers about the wind turbines, you also have to look at your other life choices, your cell phones, your computers. So many other things, and and then we're going to get into I don't disagree with that. trade wars with China, and and it's it's huge. So, I mean, it's 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 not just this one wind farm right here that we're talking about. It's I don't disagree with that at the way all. We do I life just in say it seems like we're really adding to it. So let, let me ask. Let me rephrase if I can. What is our alternative? I, th I think that this could be done a little bit more responsibly. I won't argue with that policy. So, again, my job here is to give us information, but not to make a policy choice. I don't disagree that there is a huge shift of burden to different cultures, to different societies, to different groups. I, I won't argue that even a little bit with you. I am not against renewable energy. I'm not against wind energy. What I am against is being a guinea pig for a program that's not being done responsibly. Well, uh, let, so, again, my, my job here is to allow us to ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. And what I will say is if we're going to get on the ship of rare earth elements, we have to get on that ship entirely. Wind can't be held hostage for a practice that is being used universally for all different ways that we acquire things. So if we're going to have that conversation, it can't be about wind. It has to be about the way in which we procure materials at a larger level. Now, if, if as a community, the community decides to take a stand against rare earth elements, I support it entirely. To pawn that off onto a particular technology is very, disingenuous in my opinion. Okay, so I am not trying to pawn anything off. I don't disagree with anything you're saying about other yep. technologies. I agree with you wholeheartedly. But the topic here tonight is wind and this applies. I agree. Right. That's and and what I will say is those things are accounted for in this. So if if that question comes up, it is indeed accounted for under materials procurement. And still materials procurement for wind is far lower of a danger signature than what we find in other energy technologies. It's just we don't see them, right? We don't have coal mining here, so we don't see it. And if you live in coal country and you see it on a daily basis, and you drive on these mountaintop commutes and you look down at that, that is far scarier to me than other ways that we can gain energy. 
So again, my, my job here is to say that this is real. Whether or not we agree with the number is different than knowing that that number does take into account the way in which we get the materials. So it is accounted for here, and there should be some more responsible ways that we can get it. I won't argue that point. Absolutely, there should be. But it is accounted for. They make noise. <clears throat> Unlock my throat right at the moment. Let's talk about making noise here for a little bit. <clears throat> Any wind company that's out there is going to have very specific, what's called an exceedance curve. And it says what the wind noise signature is going to be at a particular distance away from the machine. And sound decibel levels, they have a, a negative logarithmic slope. So the further you go away from it, to, once you're close to it, the further you go away, the faster it starts to decrease in the amount of noise signature that comes off of it, and at some point it becomes the same as ambient levels. And every single wind machine that's out there has this noise exceedance curve. So one of the things to pursue a little bit is to say, what is the exceedance curve for any particular machine that might be planned for a community? And there, in every community that has a wind ordinance has a sound exceedance level that says you can't exceed some particular decibel level either at town or at property boundaries or at a house or somewhere where people are, you know, going to be living. <coughs> and this one just happens to be for GE machines. Uh, and GE machines, if you are more than 100 meters away, uh, 330 feet, give or take, uh, it will be producing 50 decibels or less uh, dBA. And as you start getting that further and further away, it starts to drop off to where you're in the mid-40s, somewhere around 200 to 300 meters, 40 decibels, uh, when you get to 400 meters. So they have examples here of, of decibel ratings. And again, I'm from ag country. So I have a tractor, my neighbors have a tractor. And one of the things that's really important to keep in mind is, again, if we're going to play a game of sound, there should be something here that's fair. I'm not the judge of what that is. What I do know is when I look at ag, people in the agricultural community are really concerned about noise levels, especially if you're operating any equipment or you're nearby or around it. And so this doesn't come from wind stuff at all. This comes from those who are interested in understanding the way sound impacts agricultural workers. So let's start here at 40 decibels, which is a typical wind machine somewhere between oh, 200 and 300 meters. Uh, this is the way that the ag community describes it at 40 decibels. Kitten meowing, songbirds, distant dog bark. If I go to 50 decibels, which is about 100 meters away, is your refrigerator running, a babbling stream, a quiet, empty barn? These are the numbers that people are talking about. Okay? When, when we start saying wind systems have to have some decibel level lower than 40 dBA at some location, uh, we become into the world of uh, you are our conversation that we're having right now is well above that level. The conversation that you are hearing my voice is approximately 60 dBA relative to wind machines that are putting out 40 to 50 dBA when you're some distance away from them. Wouldn't it be fair to say that these are noise events, though? This isn't. This is a little different than the continuous. Pulse of, of noise. I mean, if you heard a kitten meowing 24 7, I think that would be a little different than saying 40 decibels is like hearing a kitten meow. It sounds great if it's just an event, but as a constant, it's. So if we're all quiet right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a noise event. <laughs> so, so my point is, if we, if we are, we'll try this again. Right. What is our background noise level in here? Fifty. Thirty. 
Where we are right now, I have a DBA measure on my phone. What's that? <laughs> okay. So my DBA right now is 41.4 DBA. As soon as I talk, it jumps up. Now, I, I absolutely agree with you, it's a noise event. If I were to add up all the events that I hear through a daily basis, your average DBA level around a house in a rural landscape is right around this 50 DBA level. No, it's not. Uh, it's not. Not even Caltech studies data. What did I say? Um, I believe yeah. nighttime winter with high teens. Oh, that's on a calm day, not with wind. The ground. Okay. The other part of this numbers game, because that's what it is, the game is we're talking DBA, okay? That's only sound that's basically perceptible to humans. Agreed. Okay. Um, wind turbines generate sound. Uh, it has a distinct acoustic signature. Uh, Two of them, in fact. You have uh, late pass harmonics, yep. and amplitude modulation, okay? Uh, and those tend to be in the lower frequencies, and DBA an does sound, not right? address that. Uh, DBC mm -hmm. addresses the lower frequencies and gives you a clearer picture. It gives you a different picture. I don't know if it's clearer. In fact, I would argue it muddles the water a little bit. Now, if we're going to get into DBA versus DBC, um, we have to take into account full signatures that are going on. And, and um, I, I agree that that is worth looking at. So here's my question about that, is what, what is another component that we have that we look at the full sound signature to see what its impacts are on humans? Other than wind turbines. What's something that you make conscious decisions about based on some additional decibel level other than turbines. My dishwasher. It's our own equipment running. And, and some of that runs 6, 8, 10, 12 hours a day. Yep. 24. Trans Airplanes. I can't, I can't do that. You're talking about ball tank or so. So that's what this is all about, is the ag equipment, the big ag equipment. I, I agree. Right? Your dishwasher is sold on a DBA level. Um, microwaves are sold on a DBA level, refrigerators are sold on a DBA level, and the reason is because we're interested in how they affect humans. Um, that, that's just the nature of it. If we're going to get in addressing all of this, my recommendation for the town is anything that's around should be held to the same noise standards. Everything. And as a town, as a community, you should plan your community around that. Again, I'm not arguing that if we have a sound signature concern, that the community does not address that. What I'm suggesting is it doesn't address it through a single technology. Because if you really are concerned about this, if I was genuinely concerned about this, right here, this 80 dBA level, I can tell you what, every single time my neighbor drives his tractor this far from my property line, and he does it 12 hours a day. I would be really interested in the town pursuing a DBA level at my house for that individual. Does he do it 24-7? I'm sorry? Does he do it 24-7? Oh, no. Neither does a wind turbine. Okay. Well, we'll get to intermittency in a bit, because I'm going to guess that'll be one of the other concerns, is intermittency of turbines. <laughs> so if I looked at capacity factors, it's about 38% of the time that they are at a DBA level that's relatively high. So, again, I'm not suggesting that the community doesn't investigate sound. But I think if they're going to hold sound at a constant level for every homeowner, 
that it should be done for all technologies that are out in the community, not just a single machine. Okay, now that, that school of thought, you can backtrack that to the avian and, and bat mortality, okay? This is, stay with me for a second. That's and my say, next one. And say um, that so many cars kill, you know, so many birds, you know, whatever the estimate is for, for that. Uh, well, and wind turbines will, uh, estimated to, uh, you know, bird kill might be X amount. Yep. Uh, fact is, cars aren't going away. And why not? Why add more to it? Mm. Why That's a great question. It? It's, a, it's a wonderful question. Is, is it okay if I go from noise to next one? Yeah. Because I agree. Again, these are all my concerns as well. I, I live in and around turbines. So I share all of these concerns. How close? I'm sorry? How close? Uh, 2,200 feet is the one that's proposed for my house. Is that, I, I don't know, is that close? Is that a concern? Yeah, it's close. I, I'm, it's worse the ones I'm here. So, I, I mean, I, I'm genuine when I say these are my concerns. Right? Because this affects me too. I do have a question about, about infrasound. We decided we weren't going to discuss that. Not yet. Uh, I didn't decide we weren't going to discuss it, but please ask. Well, is it true that infrasound travels further than audible sound? Uh, well, it's different. It dissipates at a different rate. So oh, it's, right. long, it's longer waves, so it has a stronger penetration rate. So it travels further. It does. It changes its frequency differently. So it's not that it goes away. It just has a a change in, in the way that the frequency is generated. So they all dissipate with time. Okay, it's just that it takes a longer time for it to dissipate. So if it's easier to think about it as going further, fine, we'll, we'll sure, kind of. Okay, so uh, in your opinion, what are concerns <clears throat> with infrasound? <clears throat> On a human? Correct. Almost none. If it was, we would be destroyed by infrasound coming from so many other things. And another way of, of explaining this is when you look at animal communities, aside from humans, that have lived in and around wind turbines in Europe for years and years, there hasn't been a single known incident that can link any animal. I mean, there are things that say that it affects your organs and your equilibrium and all sorts of things, but they can't find that in any animal other than a human at all. And we'll talk about the, why that is a little bit later. Um, there hasn't been a single replicated study that has effects of this on humans from a wind turbine. Not one. There have been people, we'll, 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 if I can just shelf that for a couple of minutes, if that's okay, but I will come back to it. Because again, it's important to me as well. <clears throat> Killing things. I'm not gonna play the game of, will cars kill birds? <clears throat> will cats at your house kill birds? Will the windows kill birds. I think all of us know that this is true. And I guess this raises the question of what do we add another thing in the world to kill birds? Uh, so this is, this is common for any wind farm. They have to do monitoring on this stuff for wildlife. So, excuse me, uh, they have to make sure that they are within their allotted kills. Everything is going to kill something that we put up in this world. There, there's no such thing as a, I was gonna say a free lunch, but I, I, I don't know what that is. But if I were to look at what this says, uh, this is for the Maple Ridge Rin Farm, that's uh, 200 machines up in Lauville, 199, they didn't get permitting for the last one. So uh, if I look at this, what they find is for the wind farm as a whole, they get 1,151 incidents, this is for birds in particular, 5.81 incidents per megawatt per season, or 9.59 incidents per turbine per season. Now when you say birds, are you talking? Everything. So everything from little eagles. passerines to big eagles to whatever it happens to be. It, it does go into very specific detail about what <coughs> those different birds are. I'm just talking a sheer rounded number here at the very end. Yes, sir. Uh, can I just ask a question? Please. You know, it relates to the bird take. Yeah. Um, 
on average, what would you say a blade, and I know they vary in length, Go ahead. but how about 289 foot blades? Okay. What would they, would seven to 10 ton, would that be a get? Fair guesstimate, or I don't know. Way I I I I don't know because blade geometry changes so much that it would be unfair of me to even guess. Okay. But um, let, let's give it blades. a number. Seven tons. It All seems right. like you're prepared blade, for the question, so I like um, it. Blade speed, and that's that would be relative to blade size, but well, to, so tip. blade tip speed. Okay. Yes. What would you? You know, I've heard different numbers. Most of them have to keep it below 200 miles per hour, 180 okay. miles per hour, so that they don't delaminate. So the tip speed is about that, otherwise they delaminate. Okay, and we take a four ounce bird, mm -hmm. and it gets struck by the tip mm -hmm. of a seven ton blade traveling at under 200 miles an hour, mm -hmm. according to the what water bond society they vaporize sure they do so there's no count there there's nothing left the other issue regarding the bird counts uh, the collection methodologies sure uh, you know during the night once scavengers find uh, learn yeah. that wind turbines are a food source uh, food will quickly disappear and the count won't be accurate if you're looking for an accurate count. So I just would like your comment on that. Sure. Um, so a, a few things about that. In terms of vaporizing the bird, uh, there are remnants uh, that you should be able to find. And if you vaporize some particular aspect of them, uh, the accounting methods that they have account for additional losses beyond ones that they are able to find. It accounts for predation. Uh, and so there are statistical estimates that build in those unknown variables. So when you start uh, projecting numbers, they do account for birds that they aren't able to find. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. Uh, could it be better? Probably. Does it mean that there are lots of birds dying that no one can account for? Probably not. Okay? It, it does mean that there are birds that aren't accounted for but it doesn't mean that that number is off the charts different. The, the game of statistics doesn't allow us to, to be that far off here. Um, so it is built into the models. And again, the, the, the issue isn't, is it perfectly accurate? It, it's whether or not the, the story changes. Again, scientific discourse here, they will find some differences. In terms of actual impactful differences, they're very, very few. So, uh, when we, when we see these, I take this with a grain of salt and say, is the story going to change dramatically if there are some additional losses from the, the blades really doing a number on the birds? And is, it, is there going to be some additional loss from predation that we didn't account for? Is the story going to change dramatically because of those things? Uh, and time and time again, they find that that's not the case. So who's there? <coughs> The independent folks. So this was done by NYSERDA. NYSERDA contracted out to DEC. DEC contracted out to an independent third-party wildlife uh, association to go out and collect these data. So it has nothing to do with the turbines. It has nothing to do with the town. It has to do with those who are interested in understanding wildlife mortality. And again, you're welcome to, to put all these reports in. Uh, I have all the links in here. Again, I'll share this with you so you don't need to track down the links. Um, they're all in here. So again, it, 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 don't trust what I'm saying. And this is quite honest. Please don't trust what I'm saying. Any one of these, I provide all the links so you can follow my logic train through this. My goal is not to persuade, just to inform as much as I can. <clears throat> so birds, that was those. Uh, if I look at bats, bats tend to be a much bigger issue, particularly in New York State because our bat population is already going down quite low uh, from white nose disease. And if I look at these, 14.87 uh, incidents per megawatt per season or 24 and a half incidents per turbine per season. Again, bats to me tend to be a much bigger concern of how do turbines deal with this. Uh, and then we have some information <coughs> here of, of numbers and, and their validity. I will ask one question about this information, and it's right here. What is an acceptable risk? We don't get any energy for free. 
get electricity. We have to get it. If we look at the way we get it right now, it's from coal, it's from natural gas. There's quite a bit of nuclear in New York State. Hydro, hydro has a significant impact as well that we're not talking about today. My question is, what is an acceptable risk? I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know we use electricity, and I do know we have to produce it, and I do know that these numbers are far lower than almost any other alternative that I know of, if my concern is genuinely for wildlife communities. I don't know what the acceptable risk is. I will let you guys decide that. But realize there is no such thing as a clean technology that's perfect for wildlife. It doesn't happen. But if we're talking about something where we have 0.0053 incidents per megawatt hour per year, that number is so far lower than any other technology that I am aware of, even large solar farms. I'm not sure there's a genuine argument here. And, and I have degrees in wildlife biology and forestry. These things are critically important to me. And I don't know of a technology that allows us to produce electricity at lower mortality rates. I don't know of one. But I'm all ears if somebody else does. Genuinely. One thing we haven't really touched base on, uh, I think you kind of asked the question earlier and we never followed through with it, was um, basically what's the answer to our energy issue? What other things can we do? And one thing that's very inconvenient, and God forbid our lifestyles change, is reduction. Man after my own heart. Okay. Uh, why do we have to gimme, 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 and let's take, 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 and suck it dry? Can I come back to that one in just a moment? Okay. Because, like I say, after my own heart. In fact, Scott is one of my students, knows day one of our program is reduce. If you really want to talk about this game, reduce your energy consumption. Then a lot of these issues go away. We'll keep going. Because, again, I agree. Intermittency. I'm going to make this real short and sweet. It is absolutely true wind is employing when it needs to be or when we want it to be. In fact, if I look at capacity factors for sites around here, we get a capacity factor of about, oh, maybe 40%, somewhere in those neighborhoods, 42 maybe, which means our systems are only producing equivalent to what they should about 40% of the time. So this also links back to noise signatures and lots of other things as well. It is inherently intermittent. So it's not a 24-7 production thing. Any wind company who could get 100% production, they would be all over that site and there's nothing we could do to keep them out. Um, this is our reality. 40% around here is about the name plate for these. <clears throat> so the issue a lot of people have is, well, how do you deal with storing energy when uh, it's not windy and you still need electricity? The other thing is, how do you curtail it? So if it's really windy and you don't need all the energy, like in the middle of the night, what do you do with it? This is a big issue, and not just for wind, it's true for almost any technology we have. There is huge push for this right now. If I look at our grid nationally, and particularly within New York State, there's not a single large project that I'm aware of that's going forward that doesn't have significant battery bank storages. Now this again will come back to rare earth elements, and we'll have to talk about lithium mining and that kind of thing as well here. And this is true for anywhere. But there's not a single battery in any one of our cell phones or anything else we have with us that this is not the exact same discussion for. So again, it's not, it's not a fruitful discussion to have this on wind of how do we procure batteries or what do they do. The issue is this is happening on our entire grid to deal with intermittency. Because we have to shift to renewables like wind and solar, again, it has to happen you have to have ways of storing them. There is a huge push for this right now, and in fact, like other things, it's mandated in New York State that large projects go forward with battery production specifically to deal with intermittency and, cur and curtail that. It has to be that way. I, d I haven't looked to see if this, is this one going forward with storage too? Yes. yes. Okay. And, and honestly, there's no other responsible way to deal with intermittent energy than to pair it with storage. So. It's one of those things that absolutely has to happen. Our grid is so far behind in technology from like a grid like Singapore's, where they have, they measure their outages in a year on portions of a second per customer per year. In the United States, we still measure this in hours per year per customer because we have no storage on the grid. 
So this is, this is not just for wind, this is for everything. This is going to be a huge issue. <clears throat> but again, I'm not going to beat that point up. Property values decrease. This is another big one. <clears throat> this is another favorite for cherry picking. Uh, the way that this works, and this has a lot to do with interpretations. And so one of these uh, studies that came out relatively recently in 2019, April of this year, it started off with a, a video that uh, President Trump made, and he claimed 75% property value reduction if you have turbines in sight, and that sparked this whole thing, right? So his Twitter campaign did something. And, well, you have to be careful what you ask for sometimes because people will fact check you. And, and uh, so because of that, this study went through and it was a pretty wide sweeping study that was done. And what did they examine? They examined property values as a function of noise pollution, shadow flicker, which is when the blades spin around, you get a, a shadow signature that goes behind it, health impacts, uh, sleep challenges, visual impacts, all these things that are associated in some way, shape or form with turbines whether or not they're, whether they are real or perceived. And so after going through all of this, they started looking at what did property values actually do? So what they found is uh, anticipation of those things is what negatively affected turbine pricing. And I'll give you an example of that. When I bought my house where we bought it, inside of two wind farms with development of a third in mind, the woman who sold us our house couldn't wait to get out of, couldn't wait to get out. So she lowered her property value so it would sell quickly because she was really concerned that it wouldn't sell once, prop, once turbines went up. So we got a steal for my house. It also happened I was interested in having one near where turbines were. So it was kind of a double positive effect for me. But at the same time, that perceived effect is consistent everywhere wind systems come in. When people perceive that turbines are going to be negatively um, <coughs> thought of in the community, they will inherently start dumping properties, and as they do, value goes down. This has been shown a few times over. Um, the stigma of turbines, what it most certainly does is diminish the number of people interested in your property. That is absolutely fact. Okay, so if you are interested in selling a property that has turbines that are within the view shed, the number of people who will buy it goes down. But that doesn't mean necessarily that your value has gone down. It might mean a longer, slightly longer time on the market. And for sure, if you have to carry costs, that has a total net loss. And, and, and that is certainly true. But the actual value has been shown to be maintained. If I continue on to other studies. So this was done in 2013. And this is the largest study that I'm aware of. <clears throat> it was a meta-analysis. So they take huge databases worth of information. And uh, what they found in this study uh, they looked at 50,000 home sales that were in 27 counties and 9 states. And uh, again, this is the largest one that I found. What they found, no statistical evidence that home values near turbines were affected post-construction or post-announcement. This is the largest study that I'm aware of. Now, let's ask a few things here that, that are important about this. Is do some homes sell for less money? Yes, they do. But what this is saying is that when you look at large studies of what is the genuine impact on these systems, there is no net effect here. There just isn't. And if I were to look at some particular communities, some particular communities have seen lower house sales. And there's no way around that. Some communities have seen increases in house sales. So what the net effect is, no change. Does that mean I can predict, if you were to put your house on the market, that it would not sell for less? Absolutely not. I, I can't make that kind of a prediction. But I also know that there's no data to suggest that I should start thinking that because you put a house on a market in the view of a turbine, that your value would go down. And I think that's important to to think about. Do you think this will change as turbines get bigger? Because at the time of this study and where you live, the turbines are half the size of the ones that are being proposed here, which I would think doubles the aesthetics issue. Sure. Um, 
So uh, I'm, I'm torn of how to answer that because I don't have the predictive. I, I would love to, to give you a stronger answer than what I'm about to give. My thought is it'll cancel itself out. And the reason is because all turbines that are going in are larger now than they were when the ones around me went in. Um, they're all larger. But the second thing is because more of them are occurring on the landscape, they become more commonplace anyway. And so if somebody wants a rural home, the likelihood of it being close to a machine becomes far more likely in the future. And so the net effect, I think, is kind of a wash. I don't have any data to support that whatsoever. Um, I, and I, I, I don't recall whether this had any um, variance accounted for by height of machines. I, I, I don't know. So I, 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 I want to very clearly say, I don't know. But if I were to take a guess, my guess is, as they become more commonplace, the difference of house value around them is also going to diminish. The communities that they have found that have lower resale costs, I will say, have had towns that weren't very well engaged. Now, what do I mean by that? By engaged, I don't mean arguing. What I mean by that is, when you look at things like shadow flicker or noise exceedance curves, if you make sure turbines are far enough spaced from homes, the way that they should be, then the property values show no issues whatsoever. Where communities were not engaged and turbines were put very close to homes, where the shadow flicker is directly hitting, I'm not talking about very early in the morning or very late at night, where it's a relatively weak shadow. I mean, if it's like right on top of a home, and a few communities in, in Ontario in particular were affected by this, their resale values went way down. How close to the homes were those? Um, so many of those were within 100 meters. And nobody, nobody. What was the height of the turbine? Uh, I mean, they were standard, like GE 1.5, so somewhere on the order of 300 feet, give or take. Okay, so, so nobody, myself included, suggests putting these things on top of the house. No. So what would you consider a safe setback for a turbine of 676 feet? So, so my response to that is because I haven't looked specifically at these machines, is I don't know. But my, my, the way that I would approach this is I would look at a noise exceedance curve and say at which point are they hitting a reasonable decibel level of mid 40s. Okay. And then I would say, what's the shadow pattern that's coming off of these? If that shadow pattern is hitting somebody's house between let's say 9 in the morning and 3 p.m. So is there any reliable way to do that if you don't know exactly what make, model, brand, whatever of turbine is going in? Well, this is, this is the, well, I'll say yes, but from a common, you know, no. <laughs> it, 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 as a community, I think what you have to do is, is ask, you know, and say, what are the options here? <coughs> Where are these machines going? And are they at a safe distance so that we're not getting impacted by significant effects of shadows and noise and those kinds of things? And who do you, who do you <coughs> suggest we ask that question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is part of a, 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 a staging process that goes through. So, in fact, if I go ahead, I think just one more here, maybe two more. Um, we start getting into things like this with health concerns. And, and this is where the, this kind of thing starts to, to work on this. And as part of the permitting process that goes through, the, the companies have to furnish these documents that show what these exceedance levels are, where the machines are, where they're located, where the sound is traveling, where the shadows are, because they have to be able to address town concerns. And again, I will say that the running away from this discussion or becoming argumentative in some way, shape, or form is not fruitful, and I've seen communities just get ripped apart by this stuff. What I have seen is when you ask the right questions, it goes really much further to where things start to work out pretty well. I will come back again to that, um, that distance stuff and, and where involvement comes in. So health concerns are pretty common for wind systems. And this all has to do with um, Nina Pierpoint. And uh, she, she has this site along with a couple of books that she's put on, uh, which is talking about wind turbine syndrome. And this is where a lot of the stuff started with infrasound and headaches and, 
there are 117 different known elements that are associated with wind turbines. And what, what the, the point I want to make here is this is very real. Now, what part of it is real is really important here. The part of it that's real is um, it's what's known as a communicated disease. The only people who are affected by this are those who are aware of it. Now, I, want, I want that to just sink in for a moment. There has not been a single medically viable replicated study equivalent to what any single drug that would go onto the market is held to that indicates that turbines are responsible for any one of the ailments that they are aligned with. Not one, not a single study that would hold up to any scientific scrutiny. But what is absolutely true is that this is identical to the placebo effect. And if you're into medical research, you know that the placebo effect is extraordinarily real. Right? It's not just good enough to say, ah, uh, it's the placebo effect, you don't have to worry about it. No, 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 that's, that's, you can't do that. In fact, that's why medical trials, they're triple blind studies. Neither the researchers, the scientists, nor those who are involved with it understand or know whether or not they are getting the placebo treatment or the real treatment. Because the placebo effect is that strong. And what's absolutely true about this is the easiest way to get affected by turbines is to be stressed about what is going to happen. Because it is absolutely true that stress elevates all kinds of things in your body. And if this is a continual stress on your body, you will continually have things like headaches. You will continually, if you have you know, high blood pressure or low blood pressure, stress elevates and exacerbates those things. And so most of the time, when people have a wind turbine syndrome response, it's extraordinarily likely that it is linked to the stress about what's going on, rather than the actual effects. But not 100%. I'm uh, saying it should be. No, 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 I'm saying, uh, well, it, I, I live in the world of science. 100% doesn't exist. Science is a set, is not a set of absolutes. I agree. It's a set of approximations. That's, my, that's exactly my point. Which is why, to me, 100% doesn't exist, right? I am, I am fully aware I'm a statistician by trade. So when I look at, science, when I look at statistical <laughs> evidence, right, I, I am perfectly content to live in a world of some uncertainty. But what is clear is that if it were actual syndromes, not only would we see it in humans, we would see it in other animals too. We are not that different from any other animal that's walking around these things. And you don't find any of these symptoms in any other animal other than humans. And this comes back to where we start talking about infrasound things, where people say all the things that infrasound does, you cannot find a single study that links this to any other animal other than humans. <coughs> because they don't have anything to worry about. And again, and I know I'm, I'm not trying to to say that this is not an issue. I'm saying just the opposite. This is a real issue because the more people are aware of turbines are coming in, something I need to be aware, aware of medically, the more they believe that it is true and the more likely they are to have responses because of that. You're saying the infrasound issue is more of a <coughs> hysterical response. I'm not going to say hysterical response, but no, no, no. in the 70s and 80s, the United States military uh, was uh, experimenting with weaponizing it. And uh, it was abandoned because it was, was uh, considered impractical because people's sensitivity towards uh, uh, infrasound and, and, and other low frequency sounds. In some cases, uh, soft targets, it was fatal. Other, other instances, it was not quite as effective. And as a weapon system, you can't have that kind of variable. Um, so it does have an effect. It's not. I'm not suggesting infrasound in and of itself does not have an effect. What I'm suggesting is that infrasound coming off of turbines has not been shown to be linked to, to anything going yet. on. With... Sure, I'll always throw yet out there. Okay. I mean, but 
if, if it had been out there already, and if it has been studied, I, I don't know at what point we erase the yet, and maybe never, right? So maybe this is continual understanding, research continues to evolve. I'm not prepared, I'm not trying to defend, um, I'm not trying to defend turbines. What I'm trying to defend is the scientific process that has gone behind them, which has not found it. So I'm here to report on that aspect. If, if by some chance that's not good enough, I, I, I would, would you agree that uh, technology has outpaced research in this arena? Um, is it out of the space of research? Uh, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't agree with that. Um, I would say that research and technology are always playing a game with one another. As one goes ahead, the next makes jumps, and the two inform one another. I don't know that it is wildly out of pace on turbine worlds as it is with others. Uh, I, I have much bigger concerns of other things that people are out of pace with than they do about wind. But, <coughs> but that's an opinion, certainly. So the last one that I hear a lot about is subsidies. Maybe not the last. One of them, one of the remaining parts that I hear about is that they're too expensive. You know, so I'll see headlines like this. This just came out in 2019 again. Um, <coughs> where I see a, something like this, where federal production tax credit for wind has cost the US government billions of dollars in revenue while benefiting a few large corporations. That's true. It's absolutely true. I will also say that this is extraordinarily commonplace. Uh, this, is, this is the way it goes. If you want to be a big company, you can be a big company and you can find tax solutions from the federal government in any industry that you would like. And again, I live in the ag world. So this has been a complaint for years and years and years out of agriculture. Is if I look at all the ag subsidies that are out there, they go to big producers. Okay. That's the way the U.S. government works, right? So if, if, if the concern is genuinely distribution of subsidies, you have to deal with a whole lot more than wind. That's the way our, our distribution system works, is it benefits those who have large enough capacity to take on the burden that comes with a tax subsidy that goes like this. And yes, it is a burden. You have to be a huge company. I, I don't know of any other way that this works. I, I don't know of how small companies can take advantage. A, a small company can't build large machines, therefore they can't take advantage of subsidies. So then the question comes, should we have a subsidy at all? Well, what's the point of a subsidy? The point of a subsidy, as far as I know, is to invest in technologies that can't stand on their own two legs yet. And as soon as they can, you start diminishing that subsidy, which is what we see in renewable energy. Right? For the last 10 years, they've had huge subsidies, and those subsidies are beginning to wane slightly. Slightly. And so then I can look and say, well, <clears throat> if I look at 2016, look at all these renewable energy subsidies that are out there. In fact, I would argue, only 15% for energy efficiency is a pittance. We should spend a whole lot more time on energy efficiency, and a whole lot more energy. Because I know that for every dollar invested here, it's like a fourfold return on investment. But people don't like that. People don't like <coughs> energy conservation. People don't like energy efficiency. It's not sexy enough. It's not cool. They're not good headlines for it. It means that we have to, you know, dial back. And people don't like doing that. We have to retrofit old systems. Ah, boring. If I look at 2016, only 25% of our subsidies went to fossil fuels. Now let's think of what a subsidy does. It's supposed to be for those that can stand on their own two legs and then eventually they get curtailed. But we've been on fossil fuels for a really long time and they still get a quarter of the subsidies. So that makes me scratch my head a little bit and say, what's going on there? Why is that being subsidized? Because by definition, a subsidy should incentivize a market. So I looked at that number and say 59% for renewable energy, that's pretty high. But then if I take just a slight little step back and say, you know, 
we've been at this energy game for only about 60 years, really. But prior to the 1950s, yeah, we had some energy, but it wasn't until we had this big explosion of stuff. So if I look from 1950 to 2016, and I look at all the subsidies that have been had between oil, natural gas, and coal, <coughs> and then compare that to renewables, that if all the subsidies in that time are only at 16%, 65% right. or so have gone to fossil fuels over this amount of time. So really, has it been unexpected? To me, it would be, no, this is perfectly ex expected, the way that subsidy markets are designed. You foster the markets that are in development. Fossil fuels had that development period long ago. If something new has to take its place, and again, it, it has to take its place. There's no way around it. To me, this is perfectly logical. But then again, people still will say, ah, oh, big companies win. They receive so much money. Well, if I look between 1976 and 2016, wind, R&D, so starting from like the Carter administration, they've received $3 billion total, which is 10% uh, of the total renewable energy R&D over that time. We're talking about a really small amount of money here. A couple of billion dollars out of the U.S. government is a tiny amount. If people really, really are bent out of shape about the subsidy market for this, we have to look at subsidies as a whole here. Uh, and, and again, I'm not here to argue about the subsidy market. I just want to test the claim. Have they been oversubsidized? And I don't know how you get... Let's, let's now take an assumption that says research is behind technology on this. If I wanted to take that stance, for me, I would say the easiest way to bring these two back into harmony is invest more money into them. So if I wanted to do more research, we could. Then we can test any additional claim that we have. But that requires money. And so you can't have it both ways, right? You just, you, you just can't have it both ways. So if we want more money to come into it, if we want to test more, great, we can do that. But it does require more investment. And we're only at the beginning of, the, of this investment period. Again, we don't have a choice here. Um, and, and because we don't have a choice, this comes up all the time. What's the political nature that's involved here? I can't trust politicians to make this decision for me. Well, I'm a scientist, so I, don't, you know, I, I can't play the political market at all here. Uh, I'm terrible at it. And so, but let me tell you what's real. In, in, the United, or in New York, uh, this was just passed uh, at the end of June, the CLCPA the climate uh, protection plans. So this says that New York will be uh, carbon-free electricity by 2040 and a net zero carbon economy by 2050. And here's the reality. Whether or not any one of us believes it is true, climate change is real, climate change is happening, the more carbon I put in the atmosphere, the more energy I have to dissipate somehow. The way that the Earth dissipates energy is violent storms. That's it. There's no other energetics that goes behind that. So the easiest way to combat that is to reduce carbon. Again, let's think about how to do that. 80% of our electricity, or energy, I should say, is from carbon-based sources. As a world, we have decided to take a stance against that. New York is following that suit. So maybe this is politically driven, perhaps. If I look at what those requirements specifically mandate, the CLCPA mandates these things. 70% of our electricity will be in renewable sources by 2030. To me, that's next week, right? 10 years is no time at all when I think of where my students are in terms of their energy markets and what we need. Uh, 9,000 megawatts, they specified offshore, although I'm guessing that's gonna be relaxed is mandated to serve. Now, this is not installed within, but to serve New York State by 2035. 6,000 megawatts of solar PV to serve New York State by 2025. 3,000 megawatts of storage by 2030. Um, I'm excited about this one, although I don't think it's aggressive enough. Reduction of statewide consumption by 185 trillion BTU by 2035. How realistic do you think those goals are? Oh, I, think this is, I think this is a pie in the sky dream. Now, the reason I think that is, <clears throat> has to do with this, the Article 10 process. <clears throat> now, the Article 10 process is 
a real simple four-step process uh, that starts with a PIP, public involvement, and then we go through some preliminary scoping, there's some discourse that goes back and forth, then we have some formal applications that go through, and then those get pushed back and forth and, and rearranged, and in here we have environmental studies, we have acoustic studies, we have sound studies. Anytime we have a greater than 25 megawatt project, we have this. Then the siting board makes its decision. They have a couple of years to enact this kind of thing. And if I go to the Article 10, this is their active queue. I just took a snippet of four of them in here. And again, here's the link if you want to see any Article 10 process that's in New York State right now. Uh, if you look what's consistent among these, they started, these are all, let's see, uh, oh, they were just wind farms. They all started in 2016. A certificate was granted in 2019. These are still in their final stage with the public service hearings. Uh, so here's my big question that comes back to that. We can put whatever mandate we want. There is a political process and a public process that absolutely makes this an untenable goal. It's not possible. So why do they do it? This is one of the things that, that genuinely keep me up at night. It's why do people put in a process that we know physically can't be met? Let's assume that we are all, just for one moment, on the same page. And whatever that page is, whether we're all in for it or we're all against it, I don't care which, if we're all on the same page, we physically, no matter what, couldn't hit this mandate. No matter what. So why do we do it? If we don't have a goal, we sure won't make it. That's my thought, too. All right? Aim for the stars. OK. So one of the things that is crystal clear to me, again, I've spent a lot of time, my, my, I've spent a lot of time thinking about carbon dynamics in the atmosphere. I've spent a lot of time thinking about energy systems. I've arrived where I am today, um, not by happenstance. People say I'm an unbiased person, and I do try to present all sides as best I can. I read all sides as best I can. I'm not an unbiased observer here. I'm highly biased, but it's an informed bias. I'm, I, I aim not to be energy prejudiced in any way, shape, or form. I try to be brutally honest. I read all the science behind it, and I understand the technology as well. And I've come to this position simply because I don't know another way around it. I really genuinely don't. I don't know any other way around dealing with carbon dynamics in the atmosphere, which to me is an enormous concern for my children and their children. I don't have the luxury of just sitting here saying, eh, we'll see. That the we'll see or let someone else deal with it, that's way too big of a risk for me. So my biggest concern is I'm all on for a mandate like this. In fact, this should have happened 20 years ago. And my question is, I don't think we have the time to wait. So what's really interesting about this Article 10 process in a lot of ways, many communities are really disturbed by it because what this does, and in a lot of ways, Article 10 will supersede local home rule. And in New York State, we're comfortable with home rule. And when that gets challenged, through something that's bigger, that says, you know what? I mean, I, I was a big fan of like the Endangered Species Act and stuff like that, and this supersedes all that. If you have some particular critter that's around that is endangered, um, that can't stop this process anymore. That's the other thing that I want to make clear, I think, is since this CLCPA has come forward in June, I've spent a lot of time talking with energy lawyers to say, what's the real effect of this? And effectively, this flips everything on its head, is that these mandates are so strong that a lot of local home rule is deemed less important to them. So if you have some little critter that the Endangered Species Act would have vehemently protected a few years ago, now what it's saying is climate change in the Earth is far more important because that is so much more of a driving factor than any one small, small, if you will, um, issue that you're just rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic here. And that's what, that's what is interesting to me about the Article 10 process. And I'm from New York. I grew up with home rule. 
I understand its importance in community voice. But what's now become really clear is there are some things that appear to be more important. And one of them is carbon dynamics in the atmosphere and its push to legislation. You said this is being driven, these mandates being, uh, they're driven um, to reduce uh, CO2 uh, emissions. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the reality of it, that sounds great. Uh, it's a concept, uh, something of passing theoretical interest. It's a nice catchphrase, but the reality is uh, a great deal of it is political agendas and profits. So, because California's not coming in here to... Let's keep going with that thought. You know, is it political? This is, these are all the industrial wind installations that are put on right now. These are all in the United States. The size of the bubble says the size of the installation. And if this were a purely political agenda, we should be able to find some alignment with some political map. So the political map that I want to consider is this one. And this is our last voting election by county for 2016. And if I play just a little game here of overlapping the two, one on top of the other, what you find is something that I think is fairly interesting. Now, uh, the question of is it political, I, I've been a, <clears throat> I don't know how I always get to this point, somewhere I I've been a registered independent for as long as I could vote, because I don't think either side has it right, but that's okay, that's neither here nor there. <clears throat> what I do find really interesting about energy systems is they are pushed legislatively by Democrats, but they are actually enacted in places that are Republican-driven. And I find this interesting. A lot of it has to do with where the resource is. A lot of it has to do with dollars and cents. But it's a fact that it's pushed by Democratic venues and installed in Republican areas across the state. I could do the exact same for large solar and it's almost identical. So here's my take home from that. Is everyone has a stake in this. I, I don't think it's politically driven to the point where we can say it's you or it's you. I think everybody has some political aspect of this and it's really particular. If I go to West Texas, uh, I can't find a Republican who's not excited about wind. And that's absolute fact because I've been there and I've been giving workshops there. And they are so excited about it, because it means dollars and cents to me. What I, what I want to hopefully point out is whatever differences we have, they can be solved. Because again, to me, there are things that are way more important, way more important than whether or not I see a turbine on the landscape. Way more important than that. Now, it uh, doesn't mean I diminish somebody who says that they don't want to see one or who really does like to see them. I just think we have way bigger issues to solve. Maybe that'll get some So, <clears throat> thank you. I know it's been a long time. Um, I appreciate the conversation. I plan to stick around. If you have additional questions, I'm happy to address whatever I can. Anyone who wants a copy of this, I will give you a copy of it. Again, there's everything I have is resource-based, so there are links to everything that I presented. And hopefully, I've been able to at least provide a little bit of information, and uh, if I can help pursue anything further, I have an email address up there. Feel free to shoot me an email. And that's it. Hope to see you in the future. Thank you.